Okay, today, <clears throat> excuse me, today we're going to talk about ionic bonding. So go ahead and take out your notes. Take out your periodic table in case we need those guys. So take both of those out. <clears throat> ionic bonding. We talked a little bit and briefly hit on ionic bonding. What did we discuss the other day about ionic bonding? What did we say <clears throat> that ionic bonding was? Anybody remember? Look back in your notes. Lillian? It was excellent. It was the transfer of electrons. So we have one atom that is giving up electrons while another atom is accepting electrons. Now, who wants to accept electrons? Huh? The nonmetals, right? And who wants to give them up? The metals. So as you're going to see here, as we take these notes, we're going to have this ionic bonding between metals and nonmetals. Okay? Metals and nonmetals. So when I look at this, my learning targets, okay? My learning target is to describe, to describe characteristics of ionic bonding. Now, the success criteria that I'm going to need to do to be able to describe those characteristics, I'm going to need to be able to illustrate that electrons are transferred in ionic bonding forming positive and negative ions. Remember, we talked about cations, anions. We even drew some dot notations of cations and anions, okay? So we have the transfer of electrons causing these electrostatic, these pluses and minuses, okay? The pluses and minuses that form the bonds. Also, we're going to be able to describe some physical properties of ionic compounds before we get finished, maybe not today, but we'll talk about these. And finally, okay, we're going to use the octet rule to predict the most stable ions formed. Now let's review a little bit here. <clears throat> I have just a basic, a basic periodic table right here, and here's the element carbon. Well, right here, okay, right up here, this six. That six is the atomic number. The atomic number stands for the number of protons. Okay, number of protons. This number down here, right here, is this the atomic mass? Is that the atomic mass? Well, what is the atomic mass? It says right there, protons and neutrons. Would we expect protons, if we added up the number of protons and neutrons to have a decimal, we would expect it to be a whole number, correct? So what is this? Why is there a decimal here? Can anybody tell me that? Think all the way back, Trey. Awesome. That is the average of all of the carbon isotopes. Okay. Now for carbon, we have carbon-14, we have carbon-12. Which one's that closer to? 12, right? So that'll tell you which is the most abundant of the isotopes. In this case, it's carbon-12, because it's co closer to the 12. Remember when we did the beanbag isotope lab, where you had the three different kinds of beans? You got the abundancy and the percentage, you multiplied them together, and then actually came up with a weight? Okay, we've done that before. So that is the average of all of the isotopes. So that is not the mass number because the mass number would be a whole number. Now, when we're talking about bonding, we're talking about compounds that are being formed. Now, why would we form compounds? Well, what it is, ladies and gentlemen, is the compounds are more stable than the particular atoms are individually. Okay, So we have more stable compounds than the atoms are by themselves. 
a stable atom has a full outer shell of electrons. So where do we have a full outer shell of electrons? The noble gases, okay? So the noble gases are stable and everything else wants to achieve that full outer shell like the noble gases, so they too are stable. Group one elements, the alkali metals, bond easily. So do the halogens, group 17. All right, as we look up at those, we can see based on our knowledge of valence electrons, our knowledge of the electron dot notations that we did yesterday, we can see that group 17 is gonna have how many valence electrons? How many valence electrons, Matthias? Seven valence electrons. So how many do they need to achieve that stability? One, okay? Michaela, what about the alkali metals? One valence electron. So if you were going to say about electronegativity in group one, what would you say? Yeah, well, it's to lose one. So would it have a high electronegativity or a low? Low electronegativity. Because remember, that electronegativity is wanting to attract electrons. So do you think the halogens, high or low? High. They're going to have a high electronegativity because they want to attract those electrons. All right? The alkali metals don't, so they're going to have a lower one. Does it make sense? Does it make sense that the halogens need one electron and the alkali metals want to dump one electron? Does it make sense that they match up? Yeah, because they both can achieve their stability by helping each other out. Well, that's exactly what this chemical bonding, this ionic bonding is about. Now, we've already discussed this one. All right, group 18, the noble gases, they are the ones that very rarely bond with anything. Now, I just said the inert gases, I've heard them called that, but I usually just refer to them as the noble gases. But just if you hear inert gases, you know that that's the same thing as the noble. Okay? Flip your periodic table to the back side. Let's look at some electronegativities. Okay? I've been doing this a lot of years, and I've only seen a couple of these noble gases bond with anything. Okay? Look at the electronegativities. Most of them have dashes, don't they? Most of them have dashes for their electronegativity, correct? Okay. Only two of them, xenon and krypton, have electronegativities, right? Well, believe it or not, those are the two. Those are the two that I've seen bonded with other things, all right? Most of the other ones I have not seen bonded. Looking at the neon right here, okay? It has eight valence electrons. So it does not want to react with anything else because it is already stable. It has filled its octet of electrons. So why? Why do some of these atoms bond and the other ones don't? It is because of those very valence electrons, okay? The outermost energy level. Now, if we look at the diagram here, lithium on its outer level, lithium's outer level right here where the arrow is, lithium's outer level has one valence electron, Right here, beryllium has two valence electrons. So those are electrons on the outermost energy level. Now, if you do not have the octet rule already in your notes, you need to get that in your notes. I'm guessing you probably already have it there, right? Okay. The octet rule says that atoms will form bonds if it causes all atoms involved to have a stable outer energy level of eight electrons. 
Now, does that say just for ionic bonding? It doesn't, okay? So we're going to have the octet rule for both ionic bonding and covalent bonding. So we're going to need to, to obey that octet rule, that stable outer energy level of 8. Now, down at the bottom, it says hydrogen and helium are exceptions to the octet rule. Who can explain that to me? Okay, Caitlin? They're on the first energy level. So what? What's that mean? It only needs two electrons. Remember, that first energy level is just a sublevel orbital, a S orbital. Okay? S orbital only has two electrons. So the first energy level is filled up with two electrons. So that's why hydrogen and helium are exceptions. Now look at your periodic table too. Look at beryllium, lithium, and boron. All of those, all of those are wanting to give up electrons in order to achieve their stability. So those will also be exceptions when they form their ions. When they form those, their ions, they will be exceptions too because the energy level before their outermost is that first energy level. Now, let's get into a little bit about ionic bonding. We said earlier that ionic bonding is between a metal and a non-metal. Now, we're going to talk about something, and probably I think I've just barely looked at the schedule, but I think it's going to be sometime next week. We're going to look at something called polyatomic ions. Okay? So, it's a metal and a non-metal mostly, but it could also be this polyatomic ion. Now, let's break down the word. What's poly mean? Many. So polyatomic is many atoms. So a polyatomic ion is going to be an ion with many atoms. What happens with these polyatomic ions is they are, uh, they are atoms that are covalently bonded together. So they covalently bond and then they form an ion by gaining or losing an electron. So they have both types of bonding. These covalent bonds hold them together, and then they gain or lose to be ionic. So we'll talk about that later, but most of the time we're going to see that ionic bonding is between a metal and nonmetal. Okay? Electrons are lost or gained. Ions are formed. So we have cations being formed. We have anions being formed. And finally, they are referred to as salts. Now, commonly, when we say salt, we think of table salt, sodium chloride, right? Okay. But technically, everything that is ionically bonded can be classified as a salt. Okay. It's just like the huge coverall. Anything ionic is a salt, all right? Not just sodium chloride, not just chlorides, okay? Anything ionically bonded. Now, right here, we just talked about sodium chloride. Now, let's look at what's going on here with the sodium chloride. We have sodium there. It has one valence electron. We have chlorine there. It has seven valence electrons. We see those electron dot notations down below where chlorine needs one to fill its octet. If sodium gets rid of one, it will fill its octet. So therefore, we are going to have that occurring. So when sodium releases its one electron, it becomes a positive charge. When chlorine accepts that one electron, it becomes a negative charge. So, we see that that positive and negative charge, what happens to positive and negative charges? Opposites do what? They attract. So, it's that attraction. It's that attraction between those charges that are making our ionic bonding. They're gaining, they're losing electrons, they're forming ions. Those charges hold them together. That's how we get sodium chloride. That's how we get sodium chloride. 
Now, when we're talking about these charges, okay, we are forming neutral compounds with these charges, meaning that we have no net positive or negative charge. So the charges have to be equal. So if I have one plus, I need one minus. If I would have two pluses, I'm going to need two minuses. All right. Now let's stop and think about that. Magnesium. Look at magnesium on our periodic table. How many valence electrons, Taryn? Two valence electrons. So what is magnesium going to want to do? Get rid of two. So what charge would it be? Positive. Positive two. Okay. Now let's say that we've got that magnesium with that two plus reacting with chlorine. We already know chlorine is one minus, correct? So what do we need to have happen? Yeah, double up the chlorine. If we have two chlorines, each one of them wants one electron, right? And magnesium had two electrons it wanted to give up. Could we do that? Absolutely, that's what's happening. That's what happens in chemical bonding. But the net charge is what? The net charge is zero. Okay, so the charges always have to equal zero on these ionic bonding, um, on these ionic bonds. Does that mean that we only have one atom of each? No, because like we just said, we need two chlorines to match up with that one magnesium. It's all about the charges, all about the charges. Here we go. We've already talked about this, that most of the time we have metals and non-metals. Okay, I don't think we need to discuss that again. Do we have any questions about, any questions about this ionic bonding that we have? Okay.